Hello everyone, and welcome to another Kerbal Space Program video. And you know what? I was having a little think about what to do for this week's video, and I was thinking about some of the requests I've been getting recently. And one request I've been getting at seemingly an increasing rate as of late is can you make an SSTO that doesn't require the rapier engine? But then I've also been getting a lot of requests recently for an SSTO that doesn't require the nuclear engine either. So you know what? Today we're going to try and combine both of those requirements and build an SSTO that doesn't require the rapier and doesn't require the nuclear engine either. We're only going to be using the aero spike for this craft that you can see forming before your eyeballs on the screen. Now, some of you may be aware that I have in fact made an aero spike SSTO before, but this was all the way back in 2017. So I feel like enough time has passed that a lot of viewers now won't have seen that video, but more importantly, I'm just not very happy with that video itself, like, I don't really mind the video, I suppose, but the actual craft, I don't think was very good, like, it looked very ugly, which admittedly is one of the driving factors for me wanting to redesign it, but it couldn't carry very much to orbit either. This design, I feel, is much better looking, and it can carry over an extra tonne into low kerbin orbit, which in relatable terms means it can carry more than 720 extra bottles of whiskey to the nearest space station to assist the crew with whatever uh, endeavours they're doing, or probably would act as a detriment. So we're not going to actually be delivering whiskey into space. Instead, we're going to be doing something a little bit more practical and in service of our space program. We're going to be delivering a separatable orbital spacecraft, which can then leave low kerbin orbit, land somewhere else on a different celestial body, and then can return to the SSTO, which can then you know bring it all back to the Kerbal Space Center's runway. And speaking of the runway, we are no longer on it. There's me segueing to talk about the footage for once in my videos. Uh, it's a very, very steep ascent. Obviously, we're not using air breathing engines, so no need to spend loads and loads of time in the lower atmosphere picking up speed. We can just do basically once we're off the runway, we're going to be basically flying this like it were a rocket. So going straight upwards pretty much trying to tip over gradually to 45 degrees on the nav ball by the time we reach the 10 kilometer mark. You guys probably know how rockets fly in Kerbal Space Program at this point, so I won't spend too much time talking about the ascent itself. Just going back to the mission profile quite quickly. Uh, again, it is fairly similar to my last Aerospike SSTO mission, but I feel like it's cooler because, again, the last Aerospike mission, it didn't have as much payload capacity as this particular SSTO does, so the actual spacecraft that it deployed was unmanned. It was just a robotic probe. It could land on the MUN and then just do a bit of science and then come back, but that's not very exciting. So this one is not only going to be a spacecraft that can go somewhere else, it is going to be a spacecraft with a command pod built into it. I don't know why I'm saying all of this, like you didn't see the time-lapse, although I guess maybe some people skip the time-lapse just to get straight to the video. So for those that skipped the time-lapse, it's going to be a spacecraft with a command pod on board so that it can go and you know do something on another planet, but bring a Kerbal with us so we can do the all-important flag plant on the surface of where it is we go. I feel like I'm keeping it a secret, the destination, even though I might, I might in fact put it in the thumbnail or description or the title, I don't know yet. So I'm maybe there's suspense, maybe there isn't. Let's just press on. Now, I'm going for an orbit of 100 kilometers, which is a bit higher than you need. The minimum you need is 70 kilometers, though I always recommend about 75 as the minimum, just because you do need to have some space in order to do your orbital insertion burn. But, you know, 100 kilometers is a nice round number and it helps guarantee that this SSTO definitely definitely will make it into orbit for people if you don't get quite as efficient of an ascent as me just aim for a lower apoapsis and you should be fine now obviously delta v is quite close here we're nowhere near as efficient as my standard rapier or nuclear or you know the, i guess the combination of the two engines uh, ssto so we can't carry anywhere near as much mass to orbit and we don't end up with anywhere near as much fuel once we are in orbit but we are in orbit nonetheless with plenty of delta v left to spare remember we only need enough fuel now to deorbit ourselves so it doesn't really matter that we don't have very much fuel left over now we can start plotting a course for minmus which is going to be the destination in this video here because you know this lander or i guess it's not really this this excursion vehicle if you could call it that it doesn't have that much delta v i didn't want to be doing any aero braking with it like i often do with my you know <laughs> separatable landers i always run out of fuel enough to do aero braking at kerbin in order to get a rendezvous with the mothership which i feel like in this case is not really i don't know in the spirit 
of my mission idea. So I decided let's just go for Mimus because it will require no aero braking at any point. And, you know, it pretty much has the exact amount of Delta V we will need to do a trip from low curb in orbit to the surface of Mimus and back again without requiring aero braking. So it's going to be pretty challenging, I guess. Or, you know, it's going to be pretty on the edge of your seat, nail biting, tension, excitement. Wow. Everyone, check out my Patreon. Nope. <laughs> what a segue, not. Here is uh, me getting my Mimus encounter, by the way, moving on swiftly. Uh, you know, Mimus encounters, you don't really get a very good one at first because Mimus is on a tilted orbit relative to Kerbin's, as it is not, you know, equatorial. So you almost always need to do a mid course correction burn, just like an inclination change. And those are always much, much cheaper to do, you know, like I say, mid course. You could get a pretty good encounter from low curve and orbit, but you'd be spending a needlessly excessive amount of fuel when you could just do this and spend two meters per second to do the adjustment. Or in my case, about four meters per second because I overshot it almost completely. So I had to do a quick adjustment. It's really not a big burn, especially with this kind of thrust to weight ratio on this lander here. I probably should have used shift and control to do the burn rather than Z and X like I initially set out to do. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We can just move along. We are getting closer and closer to Minmus by the second. And now we are in Minmus's sphere of influence. We can start time warping down to perform our capture burn around Kerbin's mintiest satellite. So it's a fairly short burn, only 155.5 meters per second. So very, very quick. And obviously landing will be an absolute breeze. You can see our orbital velocity is very, very low because Minmus's gravity is very small. It doesn't have much of a sphere of influence, so it doesn't take a lot to land on the surface. Now, you can see this lander kind of has a couple of compromises, and not having these compromises would have made it better. For starters, we've got a very heavy command pod there. The best command pod to use for a mission like this would have been the Mark 1 lander can. Unfortunately, because that's so blocky and big, it doesn't fit inside the Mark 2 cargo bays without, you know, clipping through it, which doesn't look very good. And It'd be a bit naff to do it that way. So this is kind of the next best choice to use. Um, I guess I guess I could have used one of the Soviet-style ones from the uh, Making History DLC, but I prefer the look of this one, and it's fine. Once you drain the monopropellant, it doesn't weigh that much more than its Russian counterpart. So that's one of the compromises I had to make with this lander. The other is about to be made manifest. You can see it doesn't have any proper landing legs because, again, even the smallest landing legs when radially attached to those tanks will clip through the Mark II cargo bay, which, again, looks a bit naff. So I kind of made these custom ones using those cubic octagonal struts, which would have worked well if I'd landed on the Minmus flats. But, you know, me and my arrogance decided, no, I always land on the Minmus flats. Let's land somewhere more interesting in possibly the worst craft to make that decision for. As you can see, as soon as Valentina gets out, uh, it just tips over. We really needed a wider landing base for landing on a slanted surface, but whatever, it's Minmus. The rocket can easily right itself using the onboard SAS. But I guess for, I don't know, realism purposes or just having the crafts you know look magnificent on the surface of the moon it, it probably would have been better to land on the on the flats of members to be honest but there you are there's an example of how good the sas units are inside that uh, command pod doesn't really help us the ones are out the sas disengages and it falls over again so valentina you have to be really really quick with your flag plant Quickly, quickly, quickly. It's rolling away and it's going <laughs> to... We don't want to... It's probably going to be fine, but we don't want to risk it hitting one of the solid objects that appears from the Breaking Ground DLC. And we also don't want it to, uh, you know... Oh, well, that being said, Valentina has also been content with smashing her face into it. So who knows what Valentina's real motives are. But we can quickly roll it over so we can access the hatch and get ready to insert ourselves into an orbit, which you could do pretty much immediately by flying flat. It doesn't take very much... Uh, Delta V at all to launch into Mimus or we can see very quickly there we go already probably overcooked it I forgot that I should probably be looking out for terrain ahead of me and I realized I was about to smash into this uh, hill peak just here so I had to waste some fuel doing a radial outburn to make sure I was definitely going to stay clear of the terrain but I feel like it's worth it if we're saving Valentina's life and more importantly you know our science data will be saved by doing a maneuver like that but anyway as you can see we have now entered a nice safe and stable Minmus orbit which means we can now get to planning the next phase of this mission which is getting back down to low curb in orbit and re-docking with the SSTO. Yes, Jebediah and Valentina can be once again united. We could obviously get all the science off the lander and put it into the cockpit of the SSTO, though now I say that out loud, it doesn't really matter that much because we're taking both things back to the runway. I guess 
it's probably be a more realistic thing to do because the cargo bay is not as safe as the inside of the cockpit, or at least I'd like to hope that's the case. I don't know. Anyway, in terms of, you know, the practical uses of this SSTO, I mean, it follows a modular design, much like all Kerbal Space Program crafts because of the way the builder works. But if this were to be used in a real world application, uh, I could very well see this being used as a modular design because I feel like I'm now saying all of this without the SSTO on screen. But those of you with the power of memory, which I'm guessing is a lot of you out there, <laughs> uh, you know, the cargo bay in the center of the SSTO, that can easily be switched out for a great number of things. You know, we could even take the cargo bay out and put a passenger bay in its place and then put a smaller cargo bay next to the passenger bay and take a lighter payload into orbit. That would all work. That would all still fit within the tonnage capabilities of this craft. So far, I've managed to get it to take, I think, about 2.7 tons into orbit. I haven't really tried with many heavier payloads. I know with the payload here, it was pretty close. So it probably couldn't do much more than that. But nonetheless, you might be able to squeeze a little bit more if you know you fly a little bit more efficiently than I managed to in this video. So there are you know, a few sort of practical uses for this, aside from obviously delivering cargo into space. And, you know, we've got that big, heavy inline docking port. Again, we could take that off and get even more tonnage to orbit. There's lots and lots of practical extended uses for this SSTO beyond what I'm showcasing in this video. So you're more than welcome to download the craft from the description if I remember to put it there, which I usually do, so hopefully it's there. Uh, but just bear in mind that this is obviously, I guess it's good. It's a good demonstration of a potential real-world SSTO design because one of the leading SSTO designs would incorporate an aerospike engine, but in Kerbal Space Program terms, Aerospike SSTOs, they're really not that sensible because the rapier and the nuclear engine combination is vastly superior. And even in like early tech tree games where you haven't unlocked the rapier, you know, the air breathing whiplash engines coupled with a chemical rocket, you can do so much more. The reason I wanted to do an SSTO with aerospikes is because the aerospike engine in the real world is pretty much one of the de facto leaders when it comes to hypothetical engines to use in a single staged orbit space plane. I know there is also the Sabre engine, which is the uh, real life analog for the Rapier uh, in Kerbal Space Program, but the Aerospike is the next best. The reason Aerospikes are so good, and I feel like I should have again talked about this whilst they're on screen, Although I guess docking is imminent, so they'll be on screen shortly. But no, the reason why the Aerospike is such a good candidate for a single stage to orbit rocket engine is because of the way they maintain their efficiency throughout the flight. So they are both very, very efficient at sea level and in the upper atmospheres, which is different for conventional bell nozzle engines. You see, in order for a bell nozzle engine to be you know, as efficient as possible, the actual pressure of the gases inside the bell itself need to be the same as the outside ambient air pressure. So that's why when you get a rocket like, say, the Falcon 9, at sea level, as in the first stage of the rocket, those engine bells are really, really small in order to keep the rocket exhaust at nice high pressure in order to you know, correspond to the outside ambient air pressure, which is relatively high, and that keeps things as efficient as possible. Then you get the second stage of the Falcon 9, and that engine's bell is massive because, you know, it's used in the upper atmospheres where there is much, much less ambient air pressure. So the big engine bell is used in order to keep the pressure inside the engine bell as low as possible and therefore keep things as efficient as they can be. Now enter the Aerospike. As you can see, oh, this is a good timing, actually, because we're about to see them on screen if I just move the camera at some point. Anyway, I will I will shortly, I assume. But no, you may have noticed the aerospike looks a bit weird, and that's because the aerospike is like an inverted bell. So what happens is the rocket exhaust, rather than going in off into an engine bell, instead gets fired along that spike-shaped structure. What happens when this occurs is the outside air pressure pushes all of the rocket exhaust against the spike. So when you're at low level atmospheres like sea level you know there's lots and lots of ambient air pressure it keeps the rocket exhaust really really close to the spike forming a very very small engine bell it's like a virtual bell the air pressure anyway as the rocket ascends the air pressure relaxes and lessens and thus the actual amount of pressure exerted on the actual rocket exhaust 
lessons and that virtual bell shape then expands. So it's almost like having a normal bell shaped engine where the nozzle gradually expands in order to match the actual ambient air pressure, thus creating a maximally efficient engine at all heights, which is really, really good in theory. And again, that's why it's a really good candidate for a hypothetical single stage to orbit vehicle. But the reason it's never really been done you know, on paper, <laughs> it seems to be the perfect engine. Why aren't we using aerospikes exclusively? There are a few disadvantages, unfortunately, to an aerospike. The main disadvantage is the weight of the spike required. You know, any like gram of extra mass on a rocket is considered really, really significant. So having this hunk of metal built into the engine is going to increase the weight of the rocket. And, you know, it is a hunk of metal that is going to be exposed to rocket exhausts for a huge amount of time. It's going to take a lot of effort to keep that thing cool and stop it from melting. So you got the extra weight. You need to add all of those systems to keep it cool. And, you know, we've never tested this. We've got engine test stands and we've got aerospikes quite far along production in terms of you know their development, but we still never really tested them on a rocket. So that would be another uh, turn off for rocket builders. We, we're pretty good at this point at using conventional bell nozzles. Another issue is that aerospikes work quite poorly around Mach 1 to 3 because the airflow around the vehicle reduces the pressure, which then, you know, reduces the thrust of the engine as well. So, you know, aerospikes remain a thing of the future for now, and I'm confident at some point we'll perfect it and we'll see aerospikes in the real world, but today ain't that day, folks, and who knows if and when we'll ever get them. The one in Kerbal Space Program is the toroidal type of aerospike, but you may have noticed things like the VentureStar SSTO, which is the big market leader in terms of SSTO concepts that use the aerospike, it looks a little bit different. That uses the linear aerospike, which rather than being a, a pointy spike, like the one in Kerbal Space Program, it's instead a wedge shape that sits at the back of the craft. I'd really like to see a linear aerospike in Kerbal Space Program, but you know, there are mods that answer that prayer if you really, really want to try one out today. That's another story for another time though, chaps. Here we are, touching down on the runway. We've got our little parachute deployed so we can stop at a nice gentle pace without worrying too much about falling off the end of the runway at the other side. Uh, but there we are, slowing down. So I really hope you enjoyed this video. Um, again, slight rehash of an old topic, but I feel like it's a worthy successor of my old Aerospike SSTO video. I feel like it's a much better looking craft. We did a much more epic mission, uh, and it doesn't sacrifice any of the capabilities of the old Aerospike SSTO. In fact, it only enhances them. So, like I say, if you've got any suggestions or things you want to see in Kerbal Space Program, leave them below. Otherwise, on screen you'll find some things to click. The left-hand side is a video chosen for you by YouTube's recommendation algorithm. The one on the right was just my most recent upload. This is a link to subscribe. Check out Patreon in the description. You'll find links to merchandise, Instagram, Twitter, Discord, all the good stuff, guys. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend.